All right, um, I just started the recording. So, OK, looks like it started. All right, so hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, my name is uh, Augustin, uh, like Lloyd said, and um, I am uh, a program manager at Microsoft. I work on the C++ product team um, on a number of different developer tools. Uh, things like Visual Studio, uh, as well as uh, the VC package uh, package manager, which is a more recent uh, addition to the C++ ecosystem. Um, so yeah, the, the purpose of uh, this talk is really to talk a little bit about package management and VC package and where that fits into the C++ package management story and basically what can you actually do with it? Why would you even use it? Um, and just to give some examples, and I'll, I'll show you a few uh, simple demos as well of uh, how to use it in action as well. OK, so let's uh, switch to the next slide. OK, so um, first first of all, um, it, it's interesting to to see uh, really what, what C++ developers think about um, package management and libraries and stuff like that. Um, th this, this is a question. This is from a question from the ISO C++ uh, 2019 developer survey. So the ISO C++ organization runs an annual survey where they ask all kinds of different questions to get a sense of how do people feel about everything that's going on in C++. And this is kind of the, the, uh, a very classic question for our, those of us who work on developer tools. Um, if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing, um, what would what would it be? And you can see here in this word cloud that there are quite a few references to things like libraries, dependencies, package management that came up uh, as part of this. And indeed, if you go um, to the 2020 survey, um, we asked, uh, we coordinated with the ISO C++ folks to ask like a more detailed question to really like drill into what are the top problems and how much of a problem are they? Um, so this is a cropped uh, image. It's not actually the full list. There, there was a long list of different things we thought maybe could be perceived as pain points uh, for C++ developers. But you can see um, managing libraries my application depends on was actually listed as a major pain point by 46% uh, of uh, respondents. And even 38% uh, said it's a minor pain point. Uh, and, and, and this was actually the top most uh, those this was the biggest major pain point of all of the categories we had there um, and the second biggest one was actually build times which i guess is not very surprising since build times can be a bit long for c++ as well um, but this was kind of the runaway uh leader in that pain point category for c++ developers so clearly people don't like dealing with libraries uh, and that this is an area that could be improved and there have been various attempts over the years to kind of make that better uh, through package managers. And there are many different package managers out there, and some have been around for a very, very long time. This is not a new concept. It's not something that um, we just come up with in the past few years. But there have been some innovations in the past couple of years in terms of how we think about um, solving problems for C++ developers around package management. So if you actually look on, on, on the right of this uh, chart, so this chart is from a JetBrains uh, developer ecosystem survey uh, from uh, this year. Um, you can see actually about half of uh, C++ developers are not even using a package manager of any kind. They're kind of managing libraries manually, whether it's um, figuring out how to build them um, and, and, and compile those uh, static or dynamic libraries on the side and then uh, linking them in with their application or actually integrating the source code in some way and make kind of a mega application out of it. But there are, there are different ways of doing it, but it re requires a lot of manual steps, especially if you have a bunch of different dependencies. But it does give you complete control to do whatever you want. Um, so there is an upside there. Um, but there are also different types of package managers. So we, we have system package managers, um, which we can see actually declined a bit in usage uh, from last year. So these are things like apt on Linux, um, there's actually a new one for Windows now called Winget, which was just announced, um, I think, a few months ago, actually. Um, and or, or something like Brew, maybe. Uh, so there are a number of different options, but they're really uh, they're they're restricted to a particular OS typically, and they install many different types of applications and tools, not just uh, things that pertain to to C and C++ uh, development. Um, the issue with with these is that if you're uh, 
if, if you're starting to think about targeting multiple platforms or if you uh, want to really minimize the amount of effort required to get your dependencies to actually just work with uh, whatever you have set up uh, for your uh, in terms of your build system and application requirements um, th there are still some 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 steps you have to follow to really like check the libraries and make sure that they they work and sometimes you may get uh, mismatches between different libraries they install because they both depend on different versions of the same third library somewhere in that dependency graph and there are different issues like that can that can pop up um, so then we kind of get into um, language package managers which are more um, they're more cross-platform and they're more um, and they're more detailed in terms of their functionality towards the needs of CNC++ development specifically and some of the scenarios that specifically impact CNC++ development things like well having packages that can be built from source because you need to make sure they're built the same way as the application that's consuming them because otherwise they're basically worthless to you um, so features like that that's something that you would get in a, in a language package manager and then there's also kind of like a build system specific package manager something like NuGet, uh, for example so that works pretty well for ms build projects it's actually a dotnet package manager that works for c++ as well um, but it, it, it's not really designed as much with C++ in mind, and there are some limitations in that experience. And if you're not using MS Build projects, then getting that to work is even, an even more complex process um, than that. Because with C++, we don't just have one build system that everybody uses. Um, there are a variety of different things that people are using. So you can actually see there that the language package managers are on the rise um, this year. And of course, I'll be talking about VC package since that's the tool I personally work on and with that let's let's talk about vc package and you know, why why do we see this uh, kind of growth there we see, we see vc package was four percent now it's eight percent why is there this growing interest in vc package well let me tell you a little bit what the tool is about so it's uh, an open source uh, project we started in around 2016 um, it it's a c++ library manager for windows linux and mac os uh, so it runs on all those platforms it can build libraries targeting all those platforms um, and it has a very large uh, and well uh, curated catalog of uh, over 1400 different libraries. So these are uh, libraries, not binaries. If you actually look at the total number of binaries that are produced, then that number is significantly larger um, because, of course, there are many different architectures and OSs and all that multiplies it out. Um, but yeah, overall, we have over 1,400 at this point. It's been growing pretty fast. Um, it, it's this is an open source project. Anybody can make contributions to add uh, new libraries to the ecosystem, although they have to go through a rigorous process to make sure that um, they don't break compatibility with any other libraries in the ecosystem. And this is one of the defining principles, really, of VC package, that um, if you install any subset of those 1,400 libraries, they should just kind of work out of the box without you having to resolve um, version conflicts with upstream dependencies and stuff like that. It just kind of handles all of that for you. And um, we support a variety of different um, build uh, configurations um, by default. We call these uh, triplets. Um, so you can see for x64, x86, uh, static, dynamic, uh, Windows, OS X, Linux. Um, and you have ARM64, ARM, Universal Windows Platform. So there's a couple of different things that are supported there. But you can also actually define your own build requirements uh, beyond this if you have something that's more specific that's not covered here. Um, so you can install uh, libraries as you wish because the libraries of VC package are actually built from source. So um, you can you basically have control over what you want to actually produce out of that. And um, yeah, so uh, and another uh, piece of terminology there that we use is when we talk about uh, one of the 1400 libraries, um, we usually use the term port to to determine. Um, basically, it's it's like a build recipe for that particular library. We don't actually host the source code of the libraries in question in our Git repo, but we have uh, the build recipe essentially defines how do you actually get the source and how do you actually build it um, to produce the binaries at the end. So in terms of you know, the motivations for building this tool and what it can actually do, um, so one of the big nice things about just package managers in general is that you can 
um, automate the process of uh, getting your dependencies. You don't have to go to uh, five different uh, repos on GitHub and read their readmes and figure out how does this work for my build system and how do I build this and what dependencies does this library have that I also need to install in order to make sure that everything actually builds correctly. All of that is just kind of handled automatically uh, behind the scenes. It's as simple as saying VC package install boost and VC package will figure out, okay, this is what we need to install boost. These are all the dependencies that are needed for that. And it goes through the process of building uh, boost, building all of the upstream dependencies of boost and saving that state uh, on your machine. So you can just start working with it right off the bat. Um, and yeah, so I kind of touched into this already, but dependencies of dependencies, that's all handled automatically. You don't have to, you don't even have to really know what are the, uh, the upstream dependencies that are required just to be able to use your primary dependencies that are directly used by your application. That's already handled for you automatically behind the scenes. You just have to specify the dependency you care about and the ones that it depends on will be installed for you. And um, because we have this process where we kind of build all the libraries in the catalog together as part of our continuous integration process, we kind of we, we make sure that they actually compile together and work. So you don't have to worry about um, conflicts between different uh, libraries, combinations that you could install uh, and have to resolve those because that's done for you. Um, the one downside of that is uh, this essentially means the entire catalog exists as, as a giant version set, meaning you know if you want to pick and choose versions of individual libraries to install, then it gets a bit more complicated. Um, that's not something that's not a scenario that's supported out of the box. Um, we kind of give you a, a version that's usually latest or very close to latest of a library that we've already tested with the rest of the catalog and should work. Um, but we are working on making that a bit more flexible going forward, and I'll touch on that a bit later. So, um, and, 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 I, and I guess fundamentally, uh, an, another useful thing about using a package manager like VC Package is it's a simple, repeatable way to acquire your dependencies across multiple environments. So whether you're setting up multiple developer machines or uh, CI runs, um, or you're using containers in some way or anything like that, um, you could essentially have a script that just runs the same set of commands and it produces the, the results that you need. Without without having to factor in, uh, with, without having to worry about things like user error. Well, I, I forgot how I'm supposed to build this particular dependency and I did it wrong and I have to do it again and that kind of thing. So in terms of getting started, um, it's, it's a basic uh, process. You just have to clone uh, the Git repo, um, go into the folder. There's, there's a um, bootstrap script that you run. Um, depending on whether you're on Windows or on Linux or Mac OS, you run the one for the platform you, you're using. And um, there is another uh, command you may use, uh, particularly uh, if you're using uh, one of the Microsoft uh, IDEs, uh, especially Visual Studio, uh, which is VC package integrate install, which just kind of makes uh, it, it adds additional integration in these environments um, for VC package. And then you can just start installing uh, libraries at that point. And I'll um, get into this a little bit to show you how it works. So I have uh, here just a basic terminal. Um, so I do have VC package installed. I have it added to my path, so I can just say VC package without having to go into the folder where it's installed or anything like that. Um, and if um, uh, if I do VC package list, you can see here um, which libraries I have currently installed for VC package. Uh, so in this uh, case, I have uh, curl and zlib. I believe zlib was actually a dependency of curl because I don't think I actually installed it recently. So I might have gotten pulled in when I installed curl. Um, but yeah, so let's say I wanted to uh, install something um, something new, um, or let's say that for whatever reason I wiped my machine. And I said, and I uh, had to get rid of my VC package installation or something. Um, so I could, so let's say I, uh, that I no longer had curl on my, my device. So I've just removed it, it's gone. And then I want to install it again. So then I would just say VC package install curl, and then I can specify how I want it to be built. 
Uh, if I don't specify anything, it'll use what uh, whatever the default setting is for that, which in my case is x86 Windows, but I want x64. So I just say colon x64 and uh, x64 Windows, and then it will go ahead and install that. Now, typically, um, what would happen is if this is my very, very, if this is like a completely fresh environment and I have absolutely nothing set up, um, it would actually go ahead and build uh, curl from source, which can take a few minutes. Um, and then once that's set up, it's there on my machine and I can use it as much as I want. But in this case, um, I actually have a cached copy of curl. And this is using a new feature in VC package called binary caching. You can essentially uh, specify a place. It could be a shared location, like um, like an artifact storage location in a cloud, for example, or it could be a file share location or even another location on your machine. Um, for a VC package to use to cache uh, binaries that um, get built. So in this case, because I have such a cache set up, it only took a couple of seconds to actually acquire curl again. And the useful thing about this is um, it allows you to uh, save time if you're installing the same thing on multiple devices or uh, say like in multiple containers, stuff like that. Um, you don't have to go through the process of waiting for the build from source to happen on every single uh, install attempt on each machine. Um, you can just kind of do it in a few seconds after you've done it the first time. So yeah, that's that's a, it's as simple as that to uh, install a library. And at that point, um, you can basically just start um, pound include reference to that library. And you the only other thing you really need to do is maybe point to uh, where the library is installed, which will be in a subfolder. Um, in the VC package installation. And if you're using MS Build and CMake projects, we actually have even easier integration than this uh, for those cases. So um, I'll, I'll show a few examples here with, uh, with CMake actually. And I'll also talk about a couple of other features while I'm at it. So first I'll start with a more complex project and then I'll show a more simple project that can really drill in on the specific changes you need to make to integrate it with VC package. So here with CMake, um, so this is a, a game um, called Super Tux. Um, I believe it primarily runs on Windows and Linux. I don't know if the Mac build works as well anymore, but um, in this case, I'll, I'll just show it um, on Windows since that's my uh, local machine here. And you can see th there's a really long and complicated uh, CMake list.txt file. Let me actually zoom in a bit, Let's see if I can get that. Bit more. Sorry, I should have zoomed in as well on the terminal just to make it a little bit more visible. Um, but yeah, you can see it, it's it's a pretty complicated file, and there's a lot going on here. Um, and there are a number of find package commands here, basically saying all the different dependencies that are required. And this is how in CMake you just specify different dependencies. Um, but the thing is, CMake won't actually figure out how to acquire them and build them on your machine for you. You still have to do that part. And then you have to integrate that with uh, CMake's way of understanding dependencies, which is uh, this fine package. And that's the part that VC package really solves for you. You don't have to uh, go and, and do all of that work manually. In this case, the way I did it, um, so I mentioned you could run something like a VC package install command in a terminal, uh, something like this, and then specifying the library. But you don't actually have to do it uh, in a terminal or, or, or like a script that runs uh, a, a, something in the command line anymore. Uh, we actually just recently added support for a, a manifest file uh, that allows you to specify kind of in a declarative way what you uh, require for your project. So there's a file called vcpackage.json. And here you can list everything that you need. So in this case, there's a couple of boost libraries, there's curl, you know, there's there's a couple of big ones in here and a pretty lengthy list overall. So they can uh, take a while to acquire the first time, but then once they're there, they're there for good. I also have this set up with that binary caching feature. So if I were to um, nuke my my folder where these are installed, it will just go and um, acquire them quickly from the cache. Um, and it's basically as simple as that. You you uh, write this file, you include it in your project folder. And then you just have to make sure that CMake knows about um, 
BC package essentially. And you, to do that, you specify, uh, a, you have to point to a CMake toolchain file, which is already provided with VC package. So if you're doing CMake projects, you, all you have to do is point to that file. In, in this particular environment I'm using, since I'm showing you in Visual Studio Code, there's actually a way to do it um, through the editor itself. Um, because I have the CMake tools extension installed for Visual Studio Code. And essentially I can just say CMake toolchain file here uh, in the settings.json file, and I just point to where VC package is installed in this particular subfolder. There's a .cmake file. And this allows CMake to understand that it, allows, it basically allows it to know about VC package and be able to use the find package uh, commands with uh, libraries that are installed by VC package. So that's it. So if I so if I already um, so so if I'm setting this up from scratch, I make sure I have the pine package commands here. I make sure that uh, I'm pointing to the CMake toolchain file, and I make sure I have a VC package.json. And when you run the CMake configure step um, and to generate the CMake cache, it will go ahead and actually read um, this file and install any dependencies that are not already installed. And I'll actually show you because it's perhaps easier to understand if, uh, with a simpler project. Um, but I, well, actually, let me just go ahead and run this one just to show that it works. Um, so let me see if I just click the play button there. And everything was just, um, I've, I've already acquired and built things beforehand because um, it's a pretty large project and we don't want to sit around just waiting for for the build to run. Um, again, C++ build times are the second most, uh, the second biggest pain point in C for C++ developers according to the ISO C++ survey. So that that's definitely uh, an issue with this project. Um, but let me just show you that it runs and then I'll show you with a more basic project that we can actually afford to wait to build everything because it's it'll just be like a basic hello world one. But let me just show you this. So it's actually opening up on my other monitor. But once it's done loading, I'll move it over. And this is just a, a basic video game. Um, so you can see it runs. So just to prove that this whole process works. All right, so I'll actually switch over to uh, Hello World project. So very simple example. And I let's say I wanted to add uh, Google test because I want to uh, start writing some unit tests for this project. So I need to have um, a pound include to gtest slash gtest.h. Uh, the first time you do this, if you don't do anything else, you'll get a little squiggle here saying, I, I don't know where this file is. I can't open this file. Uh, in order to make that connection happen, again, there's the um, you, you have to point to the, the CMake toolchain file, which uh, is where uh, in the subfolder in the VC package installation. And then the CMake list file, like the most basic CMake list file here, is is simply just this. So you have um, the project, the executable you're trying to produce. I have a find package for a Google test, and I have a target link library specifying the the different um, parts of Google test that um, are going to uh, to be used. And in 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 order for CMake to actually understand what what does this mean. We have uh, VC package.json and um, VC package is invoked uh, during the uh, CMake generation because I'm pointing to that CMake toolchain file. Um, and it's right here, it says, OK, I need Google test. So when you run this, it will go ahead and install Google test and make everything run. But now uh, I've already um, installed Google test in this case, but let's just pretend I didn't. So the, where it actually gets installed when you use a manifest file is in a subfolder called VC package installed under, um, well, it's actually in the build subfolder that gets produced by CMake. And then under that there's VC package installed. So let's just go ahead and delete this. So now I, I don't actually have a Google test set up anymore for this project. So this would normally just break, right? But actually, um, if I do, um, if I rerun CMake to uh, configure the project and, and to generate um, all the build output files that are necessary here, the project files, it will go ahead and you can see here it's running VC package install. So I, I didn't have to run, I didn't have to write a script to invoke VC package or anything. It's just doing it because uh, it's already specified in that CMake toolchain file for it to check if. Uh, the dependencies specified in that manifest are there or not. 
and um, go ahead and install them if they're not. Uh, so again, I'm using the binary caching feature just to speed things along a little bit. And it's gone ahead and it's installed it already. So it only took a couple of seconds because it pulled the cached binary. So basically, I'm just downloading a pre-built binary. I'm not actually um, building from source in this case, but it would also have built from source if it didn't have a cached uh, location to look at. And then I should be able to just run it just to make sure it works. Um, another thing that's worth pointing out here is uh, you'll notice I didn't specify anywhere what build configuration I want uh, dependencies for. And that's because it just used the active build configuration for my project. So in this case, uh, I have it set to use the Visual Studio uh, 2019 compiler targeting x64 windows. And it just went ahead and reused that. So when it acquired the dependencies and it set up the project, it acquired dependencies that match that build configuration. Is there a way to specify a version? Uh, I will get to that soon. Um, currently, no, but we are working on that. Um, all right, so yeah, you can see it. It shows uh, Hello World. So it ran. Um, it's not complaining that I'm referencing this gtest slash gtest.h because it is now uh, looking in that subfolder. Uh, VC package installed, and it should be back now. So x64, so VC package installed is back. We have x64 windows, and you can see that it has um, the pre-built library there. All right, so, th so that's basically how it works in a nutshell. So the binary caching and the manifest support are very recent additions to VC package, like the last couple of months. Um, so if you have heard of VC package before, but you haven't looked at it recently, these are some of the new things that, that have uh, come up. All right, so um, yeah, some, some other notes. So if you're using VC package with a build system, so we do have some, um, so you could use it with any build system, but for some of them, you might have to do a little bit of additional work, but for MS build and CMake, we've, we've done some of the work for you to simplify things. If you run the VC package integrate install command after you install VC package, it will actually just work out of the box with MS build projects. Um, that will make that particular VC package installation available for MS build, and you'll be able to just start pound including code, um, assuming you've installed it with VC package, and it will just work. You don't have to go into your project properties and figure out the paths to where, every, where everything needs to be linked from. It, it just will already work out of the box. Uh, and for CMake, there's the step where you just have to point to that uh, .CMake file, and then everything just kind of works after that. Um, uh, it's also worth mentioning, actually, if you're using CMake projects in Visual Studio, the integrate install step also applies to that. So you uh, you don't even need to manually specify the CMake toolchain file in Visual Studio. In other environments like Visual Studio Code, you still need to point to it. We are working on making the process uh, simpler overall as much as we can, but that's kind of the current state. Um, so I did show when when I was showing the um, VC package running in the terminal, um, I was installing a library for x64 Windows. So you you can specify there basically the the triplet as we call it that you care about. So for example, you could say VC package install OpenSSL x64 Windows static if you want a static build version. Um, and basically, there, there there are a few different configuration options available there uh, if you want to. Um, manually specify in the terminal what you want to install. Um, and you can actually also specify your own uh, custom um, build configurations as well. There's a way of doing that um, if you want to use something that's not already provided by default. And that's also covered in our documentation. Um, another thing you can do is, um, so we have some people who use um, VC package with, say, Visual Studio projects. And one thing that people like about the NuGet package manager is that it has nice Visual Studio integration. So you can actually export uh, your VC package libraries that are installed on your system uh, as one giant NuGet package, and then you can just integrate that into your MS build project um, if that is a workflow that um, is preferable for you. Uh, but you can also uh, export as a zip or 7-zip um, you, you don't have to do a, a new Git package as well. If you want to share those libraries or just put them in some location for reuse, maybe across your organization, that's one way uh, of doing that. 
But again, if you use the, the binary caching feature, um, it, you just have to point to uh, a location that's shared and available, and you'll be able to just, um, it, it will just kind of cache it for you, and you don't have to go through the process of exporting and then putting it somewhere and then grabbing it from that location every time. That will That's basically automated a bit. All right, so yeah, there's an example there at the bottom. So if you save these package exports, you rest SDK, zlib, dash, NuGet, that will create a NuGet package containing those uh, libraries um, as a NuGet package that you can just import um, if you want to do that route. All right, so um, I talked about a couple of the new features. Um, in, in general, everything that we're planning on that's not uh, notable is uh, described in our roadmap, which is on our GitHub uh, wiki page. Um, there's a link there to it as well in the slides. Um, so the main things we're working on, uh, and some of them have already started to ship, there's the binary caching and the manifest file that has already uh, shipped. We are also working on versioning support, which I'll get into shortly, uh, as well as registries, which are basically installing um, uh, packages from multiple locations rather than just from that 1400 long catalog. Um, and we're also working on improving integrations with Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, since of course we also work on those developer tools and we want to have a smooth experience for people so they don't have to do too much setup work to get their environment um, working correctly. So binary caching. Um, so I, 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 I did demo this a couple of times there. Um, because VC package builds from source, um, which which can be a good thing because it gives you a lot of flexibility into what actually gets produced. You don't have to worry about downloading random pre-built binaries from the internet and seeing if they actually will work with your project or not. Um, the downside of that is if you have to do that a lot, it you're just spending time waiting for builds to run essentially, and you're you're constrained by C++ build times in that respect. So ideally, we want to be building these libraries as little as possible. Ideally, you should only have to do it once for the particular build configuration you need, and then cache that somewhere and just download from there uh, for any additional machines you want to deploy on or any uh, CI builds or anything like that. And that's where binary caching kind of helps to, to uh, automate this process. Um, yeah, so so you can do things. You can do something like a file-based archive and have uh, zip files for um, storing these um, uh, these caches. You can also use something like um, any NuGet server. Really, um, the way we, we we can actually store these things behind the scenes is NuGet packages. Now, these are not NuGet packages that you would just be able to import into an MS build project. They're just used as NuGet packages for the purposes of storing this information. Um, but you'd be able to. But basically, if if you have something set up, whether it's something like Azure Artifact Storage or um, in the future, maybe something like uh, GitHub Packages, we'll see if we don't have that integration right now, but that's something that could be done. Um, you'd be able to just pull from there and anybody on your development team would be, if they have access to that location, would be able to pull packages from there and not have to go through the process of actually building them uh, for every single machine. Another thing that we're working on, um, which I touched on, was versioning. So again, there's there's an upside and a downside here. The the upside of having um, the upside of using VC package is that we give you this set, this very large set of libraries that should just work together because we've already gone through the process of figuring out which diff which combinations of versions of libraries will actually work together without version conflicts and stuff like that. The downside of that is that that takes away flexibility from you as a user to actually pick and choose exactly which versions of libraries you want. And if you know what you're doing and you're only using like five libraries and you know they're not going to conflict with each other, then you probably don't really care about this optimization that VC package is doing and you probably want that flexibility. So with versioning support, which is something we're actively working on, we, I don't have anything ready yet to demo for this. This is still uh, in progress, um, but we are working on allowing you to specify versions of libraries that you want. And this can be done through the command line. It will also apply to the manifest file. So in that manifest file, you can literally say, I want version two of this library, or I want version three. Um, and when it goes through that process of running a VC package against the manifest, it will install those specific versions that you care about. Now, we might not be able to make the same guarantees that everything will work together, 
if you pick a bad combination of versions, but you have the flexibility to do that if you want. You'd still have access to the default way of installing things. If you don't specify any version, we'll just give you a version that is already tested against all the other libraries. Um, so you can see there kind of an example at the bottom. Um, you'd be able to say zlib at 1.2.11, and then again, you can specify how you want it to be built, so x64 Windows in this case. That's basically how it would look like uh, in the if you run it in the command line. And it would also apply to things like uh, the package search feature. So you, you can actually run VC package search and search for any package and see if it exists, if, if VC package has it. Um, if you add uh, a little parameter like that, like show versions, you'll be able to see the versions that are available for that package. And I, I imagine it will take some time to have many different versions populated for the different packages as this feature gets rolled out. But this is a way to check what's actually currently available. Um, so the manifest file I talked about, so vc package.json. Um, a, a thing that uh, so, so, so one of the things I mentioned earlier was it, one that's useful for um, um, or an upside of using VC packages is it's a way of really automating the process of acquiring a set of dependencies and then repeating it over multiple machines, for example, or, or across your development machine and your CI environment. You can just run the same command on each side. Um, with VC package.json, you can get even more descriptive in exactly what you want to be produced, especially when you combine it with something like versioning. Because at that point, you'd be able to say, I want um, I want to make sure I get these five libraries, and these are the versions of the libraries that I'm willing to tolerate. Um, I, you can pick a version range and say, I want if it's higher than this version, I don't want it. If it's lower than this version, I don't want it. Um, or you could just let it be more open-ended, up to you. Um, but with the manifest file, you'd be able to declare exactly what you need. And, and it's essentially like a script for making sure that each machine gets exactly the same things. Um, so that's something that can be achieved um, by using something like a manifest. It also means you don't have to write your own script that can invoke VC package um, in, in um, a terminal window to go and do these things. You'd be able to just use this uh, logic and just specify things in a simple JSON format without having to do any um, custom scripting. And this is kind of a, an example of a more um, complete or more complex um, VC package.json once things like versioning are added. And you can see um, that there's some metadata for, for the libraries, um, the different dependencies that uh, you care about. And another thing that's uh, also the versions, but another thing that uh, is interesting here um, is actually um, you, one, of, one of the things that will be added is the ability to actually um, download libraries from multiple locations, not just the 1400 long um, catalog that we provide by default, the VC package public catalog. And that's where um, registries comes in. So this is another feature that we are working on. Um, we're trying to make it easier for people to bring their own libraries, whether it's like a private library that's not an open source thing, um, or whether it's just some smaller library that maybe just hasn't made it to our catalog for whatever reason, have a way of bringing that into VC package. So that way you can manage all of your dependencies, doesn't matter what they are, through the same process. So you don't have to use VC package for open source code and then use a completely other process for your um, like standalone private libraries that maybe are just used within your organization. So this is something that we're we're actively looking at because really we're just trying to streamline the, the, the whole development experience and have just one process that everybody can follow you know, across the different platforms, regardless of, of what they're targeting, what their requirements are, without having to worry about how do I build this or that and how do I combine this or that. Uh, with all these features put together, we we hope to achieve that kind of uh, mission. Um, so yeah, th th this kind of summarizes um, VC package and the things that we're working on and, and the things that we've recently added. Uh, we do want VC package to, to be a package manager that can change the perception among the C++ community about uh, managing libraries and, and package management in general. We've, uh, we've seen the recent uh, ISO uh, C++ surveys, and it would be great if we can all just worry about build times instead <laughs> and not have to worry about libraries anymore. So 
we're always interested in your feedback. Um, if you want to try the tool out, if you want to give us feedback on our GitHub, uh, please let us know. We're, we're, we're looking to make uh, as great of an experience as we can for everyone. Uh, and, oh, and the last thing I wanted to, to cover here, uh, so if you are using Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, uh, we're looking to improve the integration there. We will actually ship the VC package tool itself within uh, the Visual Studio IDE and the Visual Studio Code C++ extension. So you don't have to have to worry about going through that process of running Git clone and running the bootstrapper to actually install the VC package tool itself. And we may do some further integration. We're looking at things like uh, having an interface for managing your packages within those environments. So you don't even have to go to the, the terminal or, um, or or write anything yourself from scratch um, to manage packages. For those of you who like a UI experience and don't want to work too much in a terminal window. That's something that we're looking at, but that's still in early stages, so we're definitely not there yet. Um, but we are quite close to actually being able to ship the tool in these products, and that will be kind of our, our initial experience there. And yeah, if you want to learn more, um, we have uh, a product roadmap uh, that's linked um, over there in that link. We've also published a number of uh, specifications for these new features, manifest, registries, caching, versioning. Um, actually, I'm not sure if the versioning one is public yet, but if not, it will be soon. Um, I know we've reviewed it internally so far. And um, yeah, so you can feel free to give feedback on that, or if you just want to learn more about how these features work and get a more in-depth understanding, that's all um, available there on our GitHub repo. And yeah, and that's also where you would go if you want to get started with VC package. So um, I think that's the last slide, yep. So um, uh, I want to thank you all for um, listening to uh, this talk. And if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask me. Augustine, Chris Ryan here. Um, you were talking about the versioning. What if you have, when well, this is actually a multi-part kind of question, multiple components that depend on different versions of a third library? And also kind of com rolled into that, who's responsible for updating these libraries in your VC package library system, say WebRTC every couple of years pumps out a new version of library, which are entirely incompatible with the previous versions. The APIs are all changed and whatnot. Who brings those all up to date? Okay, so, um, so I'll start with the second part of the question. So in terms of how um, we maintain the library, so um, again, it is an open source project, so we accept contributions from anyone, um, but we have basically a process where people can submit PRs um, with uh, changes to libraries or to add new libraries. And in order to be accepted, it has to pass uh, our continuous integration process um, that validates in make sure that nothing is broken. And we only really accept uh, changes that will not break the ecosystem um, because it is one of our principles to really keep that ecosystem curated and working well. Um, so if anything, we kind of err, err on the side of caution when it comes to that. Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of the, the process for that. So so we have a, a process that's, we also have some some um, some team members that regularly review the PRs and help, and help people out with them. Um, so it's not just like a bot doing everything. There's also actual people that um, take a look and help people work through that. So that actually just kind of brings up a whole separate kind of issue of if there's a GitHub branch out there that has all these things. Intel has their own flavor of WebRTC. A couple other people have their own private branches. Um, and then you guys, you get, you know, someone does a refresh of the code and tries to do a PR into your branch of that. It means there's redundant branches going on out there. And if someone wants to do a fix on it, they have to do a fix into your system and then backport it back out to GitHub or it, it ends up with the, it's the old uh, CKXD uh, C, uh, cartoon of, we have 14 standards. We need one unified standard to encompass them all. Result, we have 16 new standards. You know, yep, it always just keeps, it keeps on adding up yet another standard. It just seems like there's a lot of extra baggage because most of these things have their original home 
somewhere else. Um, Augustine, can I actually answer this one? Yeah, sure. So um, I also have Robert on the call. He's also works on VC Package. So go ahead, Robert. Yeah. So so these are actually this is a great point about um, trying to avoid duplicate work um, and and how do you keep the ecosystem cohesive? So with VC Package, the idea is, is that we have a single public place for work that can be shared, right? So the VC package um, public repo that, that anyone contributes to, that we have you know, an active community um, pushing updates to things, and, and we have our CI system to try to make, uh, to keep, uh, keep everything continuing to work together. Um, so there is that system. However, uh, obviously with the nature of C++ being what it is, when you do have these forks with different code that fundamentally is different, um, you know, for example, you have like 18 different BLAST implementations, right? Like with the linear algebra stuff, uh, there's kind of a standard, but then, you know, everyone has their own kind of thing. Uh, and same thing with OpenSSL, for example, or, or the SSL libraries. There's a actually quite a variety of separate SSL libraries. And the thing is, is that in order to get all of those, or in order to maintain each of those is actually separate work. Um, it really is separate work to maintain each of them. And so the idea is, is that with our central public system, we want to share as much work as is possible. But then with Federation, we want to enable where there is duplicate work that needs to be done or not exactly duplicate because it is, I mean, it's a separate code base. It needs to be maintained separately. Um, enable that. So that's where registries can come in, where we will have, you know, the reference version of X that will be available in the public repo. And we make sure that everything continues to work with that reference version. And if a company like Intel decides, hey, we have our special fork that we want to do our special sauce to, they can have that as a registry, but that's different. I mean, it is different work to maintain that because it is a different piece of code, right? Like when they change that, it can break things separately from when the reference version changes. So, um, so the public curated set is absolutely to try to fight that problem that you're bringing up is to centralize and share as much work as is possible, but still to make it make it able for individuals who do have forks, who do want to make custom modifications, enable them to do that and enable them to do the minimum amount of work necessary to make those things work. Uh, and, and so they can they can maintain those separately. Um, I will also I'd also like to address uh, the first part of your previous question, I think about diamonds and broken diamonds. So broken diamonds, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is a common term in package management for when you have, you know, A wants, wants to use B and C. And C wants like D at version 10, but B wants version D or wants D at version five or something like that, right? So you have the, like a diamond shape where A needs B and C, which both need D, but then B and C disagree on what D should be. Um, and, and that's called a broken diamond because the diamond doesn't quite match uh, when you try to connect it at the bottom. So broken diamonds are a big problem in dependency management, and especially in C++, they are a huge issue because of ODR, one definition rule. What the one definition rule means is that in order for your program to function, there really needs to be only a single definition for some symbol. So if there's a function called foo, there needs to be only one copy of foo in your entire program, which means that uh, it's not as simple as just saying, well, let's just pull in both D at five and D at 10, right? Because that would have two copies of foo. There would be the foo from D at five and the foo from D at 10, and those two foos would conflict with each other, which would mean that your program is invalid. Um, and you can get various, all kinds of bad things happening um, at runtime uh, because of this. So that's, that's really bad. Um, so what you need to do is you need to have the system uh, try to unify those versions uh, with VC package today with what you can use right now. The way we do this is that in our upstream VC package curated set that we have, we constantly are testing everything together and making sure there's exactly one version. So we never end up with the case that B wants an old version and C wants a new version because we've ensured that the versions of B and C that we have work with the version of D that we have. So we kind of like ship you a pre canned result that is using all of the packages that all build together. And that's one way to solve the problem. Uh, what we are planning on deploying in the future with our, with our versioning support is we plan to go after something that is more like um, what Go does, which is to say that uh, when is that packages can express 
um, greater than constraints. So, you know, I need to have this package at least at this version. And then we can, you know, take all of those constraints together and decide, oh, well, you know, let's upgrade the, let's upgrade D to the newer version because it probably is additive um, and we'll do our best to make that work. Obviously, you know, at the end of the day, there are some, there's some code that just won't build, right? Like, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if, uh, if there's breaking changes, there are, there is some code that, that won't build, but our objective is to be as optimistic as possible and to make as much work as possible with, you know, the least amount of friction involved for everyone. Uh, does that answer all of your questions? Yeah, it somewhat makes sense, but in really big projects, unfortunately, I've seen that multiple times where you end up having different components that want different sets of libraries. And unfortunately, if they're libraries, lib files, you kind of have to link them all together at the end, but if they're actually exactly. separate binaries, you could have sandboxing of individual versions underneath of their parent directory and then you're of course you can have redundant code and bloat but each one's going to be standalone it, it is, i'm wondering if there's some other way you can do that within a library build system of actual lib files without it you would have to do some really nasty code yeah. support for doing some versioned namespace yes. of some sort that's exactly right that's exactly right. If you wanted to solve that for lib files, you would need to do version namespaces. That's pretty much the most realistic way to accomplish that. Um, but that's not standard practice today, so that's not really something that we're investigating with VC package because, like, you know, we have a thousand of uh, fifteen hundred libraries almost. None of them do that. Oh, sorry, I'm sure that maybe one or two of them do that. Um, so it's it's not really uh, an area that the community is is moving on. On the other hand, uh, you brought up another great point, which is well. Uh, effectively like at process boundaries right like you can have different sets of libraries and vc package absolutely supports that um e each process that you're building for can use separate copies of vc package and each one of those copies has a separate graph that can be separately solved and in that case you don't um since you're not loading them into the same namespace you're not loading them into the same um process uh you don't run into those the odr issues and so you can use separate copies of vc package for each one of those and and that's how we support that case because that's actually a very important case with larger products it's a good thing you brought that up now i haven't played with this yet but uh, c plus is looking at a modules model are yes. you going to integrate into that uh yes we will support modules um the however modules don't move the needle on any of the questions that you've talked about so far unfortunately right a separate question right yeah 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 it, it, modules are largely like a um they're kind of a source they're more like a source level thing and not so much like a runtime level thing and and so they don't they don't really change the runtime model that much so they don't solve the problem of like odr and still needing to have only one copy of a given function and, and that sort of stuff okay thank you thanks for the question i have a related question uh, it's, it, you know, you talked about when there's more than one version of a particular library, um, but I, I'm now back to the main version. There is a, a reference copy of the Boost library, say, and everybody knows where it is. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you have a copy of Boost also. What is the relationship between your copy and the official boost copy that everybody else sees is it is they is it the same do you just refer to that or or how do they how do they stay up to, up to date with one another right so um so uh this is this is a similar problem that that occurs in pretty much every other system of its type uh so you know apt for example yeah. has a, a similar solution to this problem and um every every linux distribution has a similar system um uh, mac with its various package managers every everyone kind of does the same thing which is to say that um the source code uh the source code is shared like we're all kind of getting the source code from the same place we're all getting it from the central source of truth which is boost right they say this is our source code and then in these individual systems what you need is you need a little bit of glue to figure out how to invoke that according to the demands put upon the system. So, you know, if, if I'm targeting a particular platform, um, there's a little bit of glue to take that demand, apply it to the source code, 
and then to take the results of that and then package them back in a way that is symmetric and, and well understood by every consumer of the system. And, and that is what our port files are. And maybe there's a little bit of patching that goes along with it. As far as updating, if the library is well behaved and isn't like, you know, dramatically changing its interface constantly, um, updating is actually incredibly simple because it generally is just moving a Git reference forward, more or less, uh, just just fetching the newer version of the code, making uh, making sure that everything still builds. And in our CI, we test the cone of destruction, right? So if we update boost, we go and we make sure that everything that builds on top of boost still works with that new version. Um, and then we can just pretty much commit that. So it requires almost no, like it's almost entirely automated. Um, that it's just a, we we can just sweep through all of the libraries, fetch all of the new versions of all of the libraries, try to build everything together. And as long as everything is chugging along and no one has broken anything, uh, that just works, right? And and it's uh, it's very very scalable in that way. Um, things break down when library authors uh, either do complicated stuff like they uh, they they change their build system actively um, because that tends to make things more difficult like if they rename options so well yesterday you had to pass dash dash please give me a shared library but today you pass dash dash dynamic library or something like that and, and whenever they they rename those things unfortunately uh, that does result in some amount of effort to make work um, however uh, again this is where that shared uh, curated set is so important is because we want to you know there's many, many orders of magnitude number of users come larger than the number of libraries that are being packaged. And, and so, uh, you know, many hands make small work or some, something like that. And who does that? Who does that that curation and management work? And how are they uh, financed through this open source project? So we uh, we monitor the health of the ecosystem. So we do um, Who's we? Sorry, sorry. My apologies. <laughs> uh, the VC package team at Microsoft. Um, we directly invest in the health of this ecosystem, so we're primarily concerned with you know making sure that CI resources are available for everyone, uh, making sure that one PR doesn't break another, things like that. So we're and uh, we're we spend our particular calories um, making sure, like building the fertile ground so to speak, and, and making sure that that stays watered. As far as who comes and plants the libraries, um, we have a very active set of contributors that uh, that make PRs to update libraries or add new libraries for various individual reasons. Um, I think, generally speaking, uh, they are using these libraries potentially in their professional work, and they want they they want like one new version. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, everything is great, except for, oh, I need this new feature of this new thing. And so in order to achieve my goal, making this edit to VC package and submitting it upstream is the good citizen thing to do, and, and so I do that. And so they're, of course, financially motivated based on their original goal, which is to ship some sort of product that uses libraries, um, and they make some small contribution to open source as part of that effort. Um, so we work similarly to other open source projects in that way, which is people come by and they contribute a little bit Along along the way that we help them towards their goal. So, do you have a speculative CI that goes out and sniffs all the GitHub's mm -hmm. that you have originally sourced your libraries from, just to see what changes have been made and do test compiles on them, or do you um, wait until someone manually triggers a release? We uh, we have something in between, in between that, uh, some, somewhere between those. So. Uh, we do have a script that will do the sniffing, but it is not yet completely automated. So someone has to run the script, which will then go and fetch. It'll go and look at all of the tags of all of the GitHub repos or, or whatever, and then, and then um, generate a new commit with the updates. Um, but that particular process is still somewhat manual. We want to increase the level of automation on that moving into the future. Uh, but we, we suspect that, you know, at the end of the day, we'll always have a person pushing the button, of course, just to make sure that everything is good. But uh, but you know, one push of a button for all of the libraries is a pretty good trade-off, or is a pretty good uh, rate of return, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of libraries, unfortunately, may not necessarily be able to automatically be updated with, you know, for example, like I mentioned, 
dash, they rename a flag, right? There's no automated system in the world that can do the abstract interpretation to understand that dash dash dynamic library is the new name for what used to be dash dash shared library or something like that. Um, and so there will always unfortunately be a need for humans in certain cases. So, you know, we can do the vast majority of it automated, uh, but, but there will always be a need for people to do things like uh, accommodate for the damage done by other humans, let's say. <laughs> okay, one more question. I have a number of libraries that uh, come from sources that are not open source mm -hmm. uh, and are not generally out on the net mm -hmm. um, that I need to use and occasionally the up to, up to update. Is mm -hmm. there a way that I can package those in a way that integrates into my local VC package system now? Or is that something in the future? You mentioned it as something in the future. Where is that? Right. So um, in the future, we hope to make it better uh, with with registries, which will enable you to like it'll let you manage those recipes better. However, in the now, yeah. what we have is a mechanism called overlay ports. And so what overlay ports is, is it's a way for you to specify that this uh, this directory you have on disk should be considered as additional ports on top oh. of whatever is already in the system. So in this way, in your source tree, like maybe you have a sub module or something that you keep up to date with with uh, recipes for your private libraries. And at install time, you can say, please also consider this place to look for libraries. And then when you say install X, um, it can install X from your special set, which those could use things from the public set. And, you know, it just does the does the obvious thing. Yeah, that's 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 what I need. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Augustine, I believe in the presentation had an example of overlay triplets, uh, which is a very similar system, but it's yeah. for triplets instead of ports. So it's the exact same thing, but with ports instead of triplets. Good. Mm -hmm. So we do have uh, two questions in the chat. Um, so first question was any integrated support for uh, Azure pipelines? Um, so we, you can use uh, VC package with uh, various different pipelines out there, including Azure. Um, I don't think we have any special integration to really like automate or, or simplify the experience mm -hmm. of, of getting that set up. Um, with binary caching, you can use um, something like Azure Artifact Storage, for example, to cache the binaries in. Um, but yeah, the, it's not it's not a complete story yet in terms of uh, continuous integration, um, integration or just automation um, in terms of the story we have today. Um, Robert, correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm missing something. Uh, the the only thing I would add to that is that there is a community supported. Um, it's not called an action in Azure DevOps. I forget what the pipeline thing is called, uh, but but the equivalent to an action, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is a community supported action called, I think, run VC package, which actually will do some amount of like hooking this all up for you. And it'll even use the cache. I believe it will use the cache caching feature of the pipelines to like automate cer certain aspects of it. That that's very nice. Um, and that meshes very well with using VC package as a sub module. So if you add VC package as a sub module to your source code, because uh, as I believe Augustine may have mentioned earlier in the presentation that uh, the version of VC package that you fetch implies the version of all of your libraries currently mm -hmm. uh, until we have a, a more complex versioning story. But right now using a VC package sub module has the great property that it also freezes all of the versions of all your dependencies and updating is as easy as updating the sub module. But then when you go to deploy it into a CI system like either GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps pipelines, you simply have those systems clone the sub module, run the bootstrap script exactly like you would run it on your developer machine, which is just a, you know, a run command, uh, and then do VC package install. Um, and if you're using manifest files, it could install it by the manifest file or otherwise. But uh, so the point is, is that while while we do intend to continue making this better, uh, it's already a pretty decent experience today with those CI systems using those techniques. 
It's it's also worth mentioning um, for GitHub. So if you're using uh, GitHub for continuous integration and you're using GitHub Actions, um, there is a run VC package, uh, GitHub Action. Um, again, like this is not something we personally are maintaining from the VC package team, but there there are open um, th there are community contributions to solve um, this uh, this problem uh, and integrate VC package more into the continuous integration process. We are also um, like our team is starting to to look more and more at uh, continuous integration in Azure and in GitHub. Um, so we we do want to make sure we have a, a good story there. So it's on our roadmap to continue uh, improving that. But in the meantime, there are community led efforts that exist. Yeah, I was more asking about the uh, yeah more interested in Microsoft internal efforts because yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we are working on um, we are working on improving the experience internally at Microsoft as well for package management, and we uh, we started working with our um, um, one engineering system folks to uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to improve VC package um, adoption at Microsoft. So we 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 are working on that as well, like internally. There there is like a whole separate effort on that. Yeah. Okay. Send send us a mail. Send us a mail. Let's yeah, go. for sure, for sure. Thanks, guys. All right, and I think there was a um, second uh, question online. So um, does the manifest file of the library specify things like the compiler version? How do we make sure that the local build can succeed in a particular build environment? So, um, the, so the, the whole idea is that you don't have to specify um, your build requirements in the manifest itself. Um, it's just specified in your build system the way it's naturally it would naturally be specified in your build system and VC package can essentially just reuse that. So whatever your active build configuration is um, when you, for example, in CMake, um, when you when you generate your CMake cache, it would just uh, reuse that and install dependencies that conform to that uh, to those build requirements. And so everything will just work. And you'll be able to just build after that. Um, and I don't know if you know, we wanted to add anything to that, Robert, or if, if I'm missing anything. Um, but the idea is that that as a user, you should not have to specify your build requirements in a second place on top of your build system itself. Um, and like the whole idea is like we want the manifest to be simple. We don't want to uh, create this uh, duplicate of uh, duplicate information there, which that could also introduce all kinds of issues because then if, if there's an inconsistency there and you're specifying the wrong thing in the manifest and you are in your build system, that could create problems. So we just wanted to keep it in one place. Uh, another thing, another way I would express it is that um, we acknowledge that like C++ is a really complex ecosystem. Um, there's, you know, we have at least four reasonably major compilers with, with several other uh, smaller compilers. There are umpteen number of build systems that you might be using. Um, you can compile on every platform for every platform. So uh, because C++ is so complicated, uh, we are trying to solve dependency management in a way that doesn't make assumptions about the other systems that you might be using. Um, so we want you to be able to use any build system that you want. We want to make, uh, make you able to use whatever compiler you want. We want you to be able to do all of these things um, independently so that, you know, you can slot our piece, VC package, into your larger story of C++. And because of that, that means that we don't want to take over your build, right? So we don't want to be the place where you say your compiler because you, you have a different, you, maybe you install VS, maybe you use apt, maybe, you know, uh, you do any number of other things uh, which you already have in place to get your compiler. And what we are just trying to do is to solve the library part of that equation. Maybe that gives a little bit more color as to why why that does it, is the way it is. Oh, uh, sorry. I, I will also note uh, you had a second part, which is how do we make sure that local builds can, can succeed in a particular environment? Um, so we do our best to cover the major environments in our CI system. Uh, obviously, you know, at the end of the day, there is a virtually limitless number of potential compilations that you could perform, and some of those you will only know if they will succeed or fail if you actually do them. So we do our best to do as much coverage as we can, and we try to express optimistic constraints. So, you know, if if a library says, like, fundamentally, 
I don't build on Windows at all, right? I, I just don't target Windows. That's just not a thing that this library does. Then we can we have ways to specify that and express that to the user that, hey, this library probably isn't going to be working if you're targeting Windows. Um, however, we generally err on the side of optimistic and actually perform the build and see if it will actually work. Because there are a lot of things where the library just says, oh, well, you know, I technically only tested with, uh, you know, GCC 9, but GCC 10 is out. Uh, and it would be a huge pessimization if we said, well, it, it w oh, no one said that it works with 10, so we couldn't possibly try that, right? So we want to be optimistic um, and we try. We, we generally err on the side of, let's actually do the build and see if it will fail. Um, so that's that's how we approach that particular problem. I have another one. Uh, from a point of view of, of the provider of a library, um, if if I provide, if, let's say I provide a library and my code requires uh, the C++ 14 standard, uh, and, and my people who want to download my library uh, I just not, better not even try if they don't have a compiler that does C++ 14. How is, is that? Uh, stated anywhere? Does that communicate it anywhere to the users of the library that you really have to have C++ 14 in order to do this? Um, so we don't. We don't currently have that as a piece of metadata that we track. So the way that such a library would be expressed in BC package today is that you would probably put that in your description saying, hey, I'm a C++ 14 uh, whiz-bang library that does connection management for uh, automated IoT dog houses or something, I don't know, whatever, right? Um, and uh, then in your, say, let's say you're using CMake as your build system, in CMake you would say CMake, CXX required, or CMake, CXX standard re, uh, yeah. 14 required, right? I do. Express that at the top yeah. of your build system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then uh, as soon as we get to the point of attempting to build your build system, CMake will look at the compiler and it will determine in CMake's eyes whether or not this compiler has what you've requested. Um, because obviously, you know, depending on exactly what C++14 features that you're using, maybe maybe C++14 isn't granular enough. Maybe you're really saying, well, I need, I need, um, I apologize, uh, features that were shipped in 14 uh, escape me at the moment. But maybe, you know, the C++1Z support, or was it 1Y support in like GC? Maybe like those, you know, the, the proto 14 support, maybe that's good enough. Um, and, yeah. and especially as we move into the, future with things like the compiler feature flags that have been coming becoming more and more popular. Um, we really don't want to like encode some sort of fragile system that would become outdated, you know, in five years. Um, we're really looking for a more general solution. And the general solution is, well, we'll just here, look, here's the compiler that the user wants and do your best. And if you can't, if you don't work, that's fine. Just say you can't work and, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the way that we are approaching that. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, that uh, wraps it up. I did miss one announcement this uh, when we started the meeting. Um, next month is September, so there's CPPCon. We will actually not be having a monthly meeting. Um, if there's some free content available this year for CPPCon, I will be passing that along. Um, so if uh, that's it for everybody, uh, thank you for the presentation, Augustine. Um, you can send me your slides. I'll get those posted, and um, Robin will get the video handled. Uh, does anybody have anything else uh, for the end of the meeting? OK, thanks, everyone. Stay healthy. Thanks, everyone. All right. Oh, we can stop video, too. <laughs>